Can Age Conversations, where we have an opportunity to talk to leaders and change makers in the field of aging across the country. My name is Laura Tamblin Watts, and I'm the CEO of Can Age, Canada's National Seniors Advocacy Organization. And I am so delighted to introduce our guest to you today. Leanne Kaufman is the president and CEO of Royal Trust Corporation of Canada and the Royal Trust Company. But Importantly, she herself has become an advocate, a leader, a change maker, and in fact, even an author on issues that affect older people. Welcome to Canage Conversations, Leanne. Well, thanks so much for having me, Laura. I'm looking forward to our conversation. So we like to start at the beginning because this is a journey of change making. So tell us a little bit about where you were born, where you grew up. What was it like for Leanne in her early years? Uh, I was born here in Ontario, in southwestern Ontario. I actually grew up on a farm. I come from a, a family of farmers, so uh, it was uh, a rural life for me until I moved away to go to university. So, uh, so that's you know sets a certain a certain tone, and um, you know I really still have a deep love for the for the countryside and uh, spend as much time out of the city as I can, frankly, uh, when uh, schedules permit. And staying out of the country these days is a good idea because uh, with so many of the challenges that we're having with COVID-19 have framed the differences between the impacts of, of aging in the country and aging in the city as well. So you said you headed off to university. Tell me a little bit about that. I did an undergrad at the University of Western Ontario, uh, did a poli-sci degree, which at that time I thought was my you know, path to law school because I was pretty sure that was the direction I wanted to go. And then uh, after three years at Western, I switched over to Queens and did my law degree there and uh, did my articles in Toronto, took a job in Toronto. And then uh, a few years into my career, I decided to do a master's in law focused on trusts. And, uh, and then, you know, from there, took it to, uh, to actually getting the opportunity to do some teaching as well. So academia has been a, a big part of my life, absolutely. Well, we have a very similar pathway, but I started poli-sci at Queens and then I went to UVic for law school and then I ended up teaching an area of trust as well. So these are really resident pathways for me. So you come with an LLM in the field of trust and you head into the banking world. What led you into that direction? I actually was working for the trust company before I decided to do the master's. Um, you know, I was, I was fresh out of articles. I was hired to be a commercial litigator, which wasn't really the path I had expected for myself when I started in law school, uh, but it was great. I mean, I, I worked with a fabulous team. Uh, I'm still close with some of the people that I worked with at that time. It gave me fabulous skills. I would never trade what I did, but I knew it wasn't sort of the long-term path for me. And when I thought really long and hard about the things that I had enjoyed doing when I was going to law school and, and some of the studying and, and some work experience I had doing that, it was, it was wills and estates. And so I looked for uh, work in that field. And one of the introductions that was made to me was to Royal Trust. And I didn't even know what a trust company was, to be quite honest, at the time. And so I was really fascinated. And uh, I spoke to some lawyers that practiced in the field. And they said, if you want depth and breadth of experience, go to a trust company. They see everything. And uh, they weren't wrong. So, And I've been there ever since. That was 1999. So I'm aging myself, but um, I've been doing it a long time. But it's been great. And uh, I've had a wonderful career there. So I'm, I'm very happy. You know, you've really led a lot of change making, not just in the field of older adults, which we're going to get to in a bit more, but you also have some deep experience in working in Indigenous communities. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, one of our core groups at Royal Trust is dedicated to working with Indigenous communities. So when a community decides that as a result of um, obtaining a, a settlement with government, by way of example, a common example, that they want to have those funds work for them in perpetuity, they often turn to a corporate trustee um, to, to help them achieve those goals. So it, you know, it gives them that, that longevity, uh, that sense of permanence when there's a corporate trustee involved versus having... Um, rotations of individual trustees working on something. And then there's also a little bit of third party independence, which I think uh, often brings some comfort to the leadership of the communities. You probably have to explain what a trust company is or what a trust is to a lot of different people. How do you explain it? Well, I mean, tr trust itself, we tend to talk more about, you know, the work that we do as being involved in the wealth transfer business. 
So it's a lot of testamentary work, meaning a lot of estate work as much as trusts anymore. Um, and of course, powers of attorney, which is uh, a, a topic I'm sure that's near and dear to your heart. But when, when I speak about wealth transfer, you know, it could be, for example, helping to transition wealth between individuals. So from one generation to the next through an estate or a trust. It could be um, from a company to employees. So through some, you know, pension plans or top up pension plan type things or from communities to individuals like our indigenous, like our indigenous uh, business that we were just speaking about. The trust company is there. I think, you know, one of the things that um, we're trying to really build education and awareness about, and I, I think maybe we'll talk about that some more later, um, is about the fact that a trust company is an option and that, you know, people really don't even know that acting as executor, trustee, power of attorney, these, these are areas where you can turn to professionals for help. And so, you know, a lot of the time that uh, I'm spent doing you know, things like this and, and the work that you've seen us do on a broader basis is really to bring education and awareness to that point specifically. You know, Leanne, so often we get cases and I've been working in the field of law and aging for a few decades now and people saying, oh, you know, I've my family, I, you know, I maybe don't think that they're the best choice or, you know, I've got wonderful relationships, but I don't really want them running my money or alternatively, you know, I'm in a fight right now. We're joint in being attorneys, but we can't actually unlock from each other. We're in a, we're in a terrible circumstance. And I usually lead in and say, let me tell you about options of having a trust company. And, and people, many people just have no idea that you can actually have a ongoing third party with expertise in this space, kind of relieve you of that burden and preserve your relationships often by having another entity like a trust company do it so you know so often we just need to bring awareness to the option itself and you've been obviously leading that conversation about awareness changing i want to talk a little bit about your work in in aging so not everybody leans into it certainly people who work in wills and estates and testamentary capacity and stuff by its nature you're thinking about planning and retirement planning and so on but there's a difference between being interested in it and really leaning in to change making in the field of age. And I'm curious, has there been something in your life that was an aha moment or a relationship that was important to you that kind of made you lean into the field of seniors? Well, when I think about, you know, back to that time when I was deciding what I wanted to do with my life or my career, um, there, there was a great aunt that I had who was very influential, I think, in helping me um, think about wills and estates as an area. She she was, um, you know, ahead of her time. She died about 10 years ago, and she was well over 100 at that time. So she uh, she was in this field many, many decades before I was. But I, would, I was always fascinated by her stories about being involved. She used to work in a, a law firm in Buffalo. And, uh, and she was deeply engaged with a number of primarily widows um, whose, uh, whose husbands had set up trusts and, and she worked closely with the lawyers in uh, helping to, you know, look after those women. And, and so I, uh, I was always fascinated by those stories. And so I think that probably did drive me a little bit. Um, and, th and then, you know, just working in the field, it just became abundantly clear that there was this huge gap of knowledge. It's a topic that people don't often, you know, find particularly appealing to talk about. Um, so we really, you know, as a business wanted to think about how we normalize the conversation and how we do bring awareness to the products and services that we can provide on a specific basis, but these issues in general um, to make people understand. You know, one of the things we find is people generally only end up acting as executor maybe once. And so they don't know what they don't know. And um, I often do these uh, client events, or I used to back when, you know, back in the before times when we could have in-person <laughs> events. And uh, in a room, I would say, how many of you have acted as executor before? Mm -hmm. And I would get a number of hands that were raised. And then I'd say, now leave your hand up if you ever want to do it again. And almost universally, all the hands come down. And, and that's an aha moment for, for people in the audience to go, oh, what's so bad about it? So we want to bring these issues to people's minds while they're in the planning phase and can do something about it versus waiting until it's too late when they're already locked in. 
And just building on that, that same thing can be said for acting as an attorney, as, as a substitute decision maker. You know, so much of what we saw in the area of what we now call elder abuse and neglect, we used to wait till a person died, and then there were the challenges now these days we've really certainly seen at CanAge is that it around incapacity issues we're really having a lot of challenges and you could ask that same whoever has acted as an attorney and the second question is did you ever think you'd be acting as an attorney for as long as you did or is it as contentious and you know that's a that's an opportunity again for a trust company to help provide support and, and to act in that way so an individual doesn't have to do it Tell me a little bit about some of the education and awareness activities that you're doing at RBC. You've really leaned into it. And I think it would be great for people to know what you're taking on. Yeah, well, it really did start with that, trying to make people understand, you know, what a corporate executor, attorney, trustee is, how, how you see themselves in it, right? I think many would think that this was only something for the ultra wealthy or people who have, you know, extremely complex estates and they aren't thinking about just preserving family dynamics like you talked about earlier. Um, and that, you know, it isn't as expensive of a proposition as they may think. And so it is something that they may actually want to want to consider for their own situation. So, you know, what really kickstarted it for us, we've RBCs obviously does a, a fair bit of thought leadership generally, but for the trust company specifically, we, we entered into a relationship with David Shelton, who was the author of The Wealthy Barber and The Wealthy Barber Returns. And I, you know, it was a, a just a fluke happenstance that we came across one another and I realized what his point of view was in this area, but it became a very natural fit. And, um, you know, I, I was quite sure that he could do for corporate executorship and, and estate planning in, generally, in general, what he did for financial planning 30 years ago with that book, The Wealthy Barber. So um, that's been a very successful um, endeavor and partnership for us because his, his you know, very credible but uh, very consumable voice is, is something that has resonated with the Canadian public, not just the RBC clients, but, but the Canadian public at, in, at large. And he's really helped to bring awareness to all of these topics. Um, one of the ones that uh, took a little convincing for us to uh, get him to agree to do a video on was was on trusts because he wasn't sure that it was something that would really resonate with the broader public. And he said, frankly, I don't know a lot about it, but we worked through it and he uh, he did one on trust and it was one of the most successful ones we did. He got tons of feedback, as did we on, um, wow, I, I, I really wish somebody had done that for me, or that's a really great idea, I need to think about that. So that's worked very well. And then more recently, you know, working with the National Institute on Aging, we're looking at a whole other sort of set of topics of education and awareness, um, you know, certainly tied to the wealth um, and financial aspects, but layering in healthcare and social policy type considerations. And these are topics that certainly RBC clients and probably the Canadian public isn't hearing as much about and, and not from voices like ours. And we really wanted to be able to bring that and, and you know, point to the intersection between how what we're doing with them as clients to deal with their planning and, and their finances really is inexorably linked with some of these other issues. You know, we know that the issue of elder abuse and neglect has been near and dear to your heart and that RBC has focused a lot on trying to set up responses and be part of that conversation around it. Many people may not know how prevalent it is. I was part of the study in 2015 that is a community-based study. So we only studied people who are in the community, not in any kind of congregate housing, and only people who could answer for themselves. So nobody that needed a substitute decision maker. And it was a voluntary response. So this is really narrower and narrower. And we found that about one in 10 seniors would admit to being abused and neglected. You know, Our work with the World Health Organization has found it's more like about one in six. And right now we're working with the World Health Organization to change the definition because we've seen such a profound rise in financial exploitation through things like frauds and scams. And we know that if you include frauds and scams as part of financial elder abuse that are specifically targeted to seniors, our numbers are getting much closer to one in three and one in four. And our demographics, of course, are shifting in particular. You know, 
when people ask you about financial elder abuse or, or worries about that, what do you tell them that they should be thinking about? What do you think that they should know about? Well, you know, I think I think it's important, and I'm I'm I know you're clear on this point, but some of our listeners, excuse me, I got a bit of a frog. Some of our listeners might not be. The difference between the scams and the fraud, and then the the abuse, mm-hmm. and and the abuse, of course, being at the hands of someone in a position of trust, right? So, so we worry about that because it's often someone who that individual who is vulnerable to being abused or or is being abused is reliant on. Mm-hmm. So we, you know, we we worry about things like um, is there a correlation between their care and them, you know, having this um, potential exposure to to financial abuse. Um, we we also see that you know powers of attorney are are, are very powerful. <laughs> they are a powerful um, document, and you mentioned it earlier. I don't think people give enough thought to the power of attorney. This the wills get a certain amount of airtime, but powers of attorney are something that I think are still uh, not well understood, and the importance of them is not well understood. And the importance of thinking about who you've appointed is so critical for exactly the reasons we're talking about. Um, and it's something, you know, again, it's an area we spend a fair bit of time trying to do education and awareness about. But we we often get called upon to step in when there has been uh, an, an abuse identified or or at least a misuse. And um, and that named attorney needs to be removed or needs to step aside voluntarily. And then uh, we we will often step in there and um, and act as attorney to take that over for that uh, for that client. Um, I think one of the things that is interesting about our business is that clients who are, and I'm speaking for broader RBC here than just the trust company, but clients who are relationship managed, who have um, a financial advisor that they're close to, who know, who knows them well. So whether, you know, that's um, an investment advisor, a financial planner, whatever the case may be, they're probably a little better protected than um, than others who don't have that kind of close relationship because there there is a relationship there and and the financial advisor understands the behaviors and the normal patterns of that client and when things start to go a little awry or there's you know unexpected spending or strange things are being asked for that weren't in the past that's a that's a that's a big red flag and that's something that um, you know may be uh, a deterrent to a potential uh, financial abuser to know that there's that intermediary there that's got a set of eyes on this. That idea of knowing your client is so important. And we are seeing already from the Securities Commissions and increasingly within the Voluntary Banking Code for Seniors, this idea of incorporating a broader understanding of the person, not just about what your accounts are doing in and out, but who you are and are you planning for retirement and are you thinking about life events? And it's that relational conversation, again, which sometimes happens at maybe a higher net worth for some of your more retail bank you know, day-to-day customers, I I really see that RBC is leaning in and creating kind of a suite of tools that is allowing them to also have a kind of a closer relationship. Maybe it's not one-on-one with as an advisor, but maybe it is through a series of tools and networks. And I just wanted to share how how important that is because trying to get out ahead of financial elder abuse is the very best thing. Responding to it can be a real challenge, particularly when the money's already out the door. Yeah, you're you're quite right, and it is something that RBC has been quite mindful of. I would say for years, but you know, it's an evolution, it's an ongoing process, and regulation is is catching up or being enhanced. And so, RBC's own policies and procedures and training of staff are similarly being enhanced or revised to to comply with things like you said, you know, the Seniors Code uh, for banking or the Securities Regulators' proposals on on um, vulnerable clients. So, you know, I think that it's, um, it is something that's been um, growing and coming and, and certainly a focus of, of the organization for a long time, but constantly under evolution as we learn more. You have an academic part to your career as well, a little academic hat that maybe some people don't know about. You've taught at law school before. You are an author of one of the foremost tomes in the area, of which I have a, a copy of myself. 
um, on the executor's handbook as well. Tell me a little bit about your sort of scholarly work. You've been a student for a long time and then you decided to give back. It takes a lot of time and effort. Uh, does teaching and writing inspire you? Tell us a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, so teaching was something I did, uh, was, oh, it was 10 years ago now, and um, I had really little kids, and so I'm thinking that maybe my timing was a little bit um, ambitious when I decided to take that <laughs> particular route, but um, I, I loved doing it. I probably learned as much or more than the students did. I um, I was really fascinated to dig in. You know, they say if you want to learn something really well, then then teach it. So um, so that was great for me. And I, it was fresh off the heels of doing my master's. So it, you know, it was it was uh, material that was near and dear to my heart. But what I what I really liked bringing to the table for the students was the practical side because I was working at the same time. So this was an adjunct professor uh, situation where they bring in practitioners to teach these courses, and so I would go to up to York university on a friday morning or whatever it was and um and i would have these three hours with these uh bright impressionable minds and um but but it was fun to be able to bring them not only the practical side of what i had what i see in the day-to-day -day work that that i was doing at the time but also bring in other practitioners from the field that are colleagues of ours and be able to bring their experience so i you know as as a student i hope that was valuable to uh to everybody in the audience um I didn't continue with it, I think in part because the timing was probably just not perfect given I, there was one night when I, the night before one of my uh, kids had an accident and I ended up in urgent care until the wee hours and then had to get up and stand up there for three hours and teach the next day. And I thought, yeah, oh, you know, maybe my timing was just a little off on this endeavor, but, uh, but it was, it was certainly well worth it. And then, you know, the book sort of, um, was uh, another one of these um, lucky coincidences and uh, it's it's since gone on to have some subsequent editions that I'm not a part of but again it's you know such a great education and learning for me and to bring my colleagues into it to add to the add to the conversation from other jurisdictions or other subject matter expertise areas so um but I, I think it's just it's self-enriching as much as anything and um I'm probably one of these people that likes to constantly be challenged and learn. And so um, those were rather ambitious versions. I think I've kind of toned it down a little bit in my, I, I'm more like a podcast listener kind of learner now, I think, <laughs> but, uh, but I, you know, I'm still curious about lots of new things. I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand Bitcoin at the moment, like everybody else, I think. <laughs> you know, we talk about uptake for things like powers of attorney. And so often we say, you know, do you have your power of attorney? Do you have the right person chosen? I mean, we know only about 30% of all Canadians will ever have a power of attorney. And where there's really focused efforts to raise awareness, we've only ever topped out at about 40%. So I wonder if you could tell a little bit about why you think having planning for future financial decisions as part of your everyday life plan is so important. And then I want to touch a little bit about what happens when things go wrong. So why do people need to be thinking about advanced financial plans? Well, I, I think what people don't realize is that if they don't put a power of attorney in place, then, and they need a substitute decision maker for any reason in the future. So that could be, you know, age related dementia. It's probably the most common thing we're all thinking about, but it could also be, you know, temporary lack of capacity because of illness or any other reason accident. And, and they don't realize that that forces someone to go to court, that there's no one that by law can just step into their shoes without a court appointment. And so when you're thinking about those accident situations or illness situations in particular, the family and the friends surrounding that individual are probably going through something very emotional. They're, they're probably dealing with all of the, um, you know, the medical or whatever might be going on from a personal perspective. And then to have to layer on the stress of trying to navigate a court system for what is not a simple process to get a court appointment um, substitute decision maker. And so I think if people really understood the consequence, then it, and, and getting a power of attorney is so easy that that um, they, they would be a lot more uh, quick to go ahead and do that. I mean, the, the other tip that that we often give is don't just name one, name an alternative, because if you don't have that alternate in place and your first named individual canter won't act, you're back to having to go back to court. So it's as you know, it's it's like not having one at all.
So that this is why I think we really are focused on this. As I said before, wills get a lot of airtime, powers of attorney not so much. And um, but I think they're they're as or more important than the will because they're what governs who's looking after your finances while you're still alive to care. People say to me time and time again, ah, I don't really have anything. So I don't need a will and I don't need a power of attorney because I don't really have anything anyway. And I say, well, you know, do you have bills to pay? And if so, are they coming out of your accounts? And if you're in a coma because you've been hit by a bus, you're going to get better. But did you know that nobody else can pay your bills? And they say, oh, no, I didn't know that. And they said, but I have my partner. My partner will pay the bills. I said, are they on all of your accounts? Because if not, they can't do that. So unless you actually have this legal document that allows somebody to step into your shoes, even the most ordinary things can go horribly wrong. So it's critically important. Leah, one of the things I often tell people is um, I like a backup to a backup and I like to have somebody who is not going to be in the same car as you. So um, yep. my, uh, my power of attorney is, and as it commonly is for so many people, my partner, my spouse, but I also have somebody who I'm probably not going to be in the same car with. And, uh, and that makes a difference because one car accident can take both of you into a different position. Are there things that when people ask you, look, Leanne, I, who do I pick? Like what, what mm -hmm. makes a good attorney? What makes a bad attorney? Do you have practical insights for people around who you think makes a good attorney? Yeah, for sure. We we spend a lot of time talking about this. So, I mean, it sounds maybe a bit trite, but I'm not sure people do actually stop and think about it. Financial acumen. You yes. know, the the story I use is <laughs> if you wouldn't trust them to balance your check, your checkbook while while you're looking over their shoulder, why do you want them looking after your finances when you when you can't look over their shoulder? Um, non-residency is a big issue that I don't think people give enough consideration to. So a couple of aspects there. One is the convenience factor. I mean, there are a lot of things that have to be done in the same province as the uh, as the person for whom uh, you're having to act. And so there is going to be travel involved, which may not be convenient for uh, for a number of people, although things can be done virtually for the most part these days. There's still some in person stuff, I think, that has to happen. And then it could have tax implications, um, potentially. And, and thirdly, um, securities regulators, you know, they, there could be there could be rules around not being able to take instructions from non-resident um, certainly not non-resident outside the country anyway, um, clients uh, who are acting as attorneys. So there's there's lots of different implications with non-residency that I think have to be considered. And then we touched on it a bit earlier, but that whole family dynamic issue, right? So, you know, if there's more than one child and they think they're taking uh, the most fair approach by naming all three or all four or whatever the case, whatever the number is, then, you know, do they get along? Do they share the same ideas or is this going to create friction on on all decision makers on, on all points of decision? Um, what if you just choose one then out of simplicity? OK, so what message is that sending to the others who aren't chosen and what kind of a position is it is it putting that one in relative to siblings or whatever the case may be? So giving some real thought to the downstream impact from from a family dynamics perspective is another thing that I don't think enough people spend time thinking about. Absolutely. I had a case that I was supporting uh, a family who were South Asian and she had eight children, eight adult children. And she said, I want to make sure that they all know I love them. So can I appoint them all equally as my substitute decision maker as an attorney? And the lawyer in me said, can you? Yes. Should you? Absolutely not. And then we went through <laughs> the conversation and I said, you know, do you think there's going to be bad feeling if you choose one over the other and as we went through it the answer was yes and i said this is a this is a conversation for a trust company and for her the whole sun just came out when she realized that for a very affordable rate she could have an ongoing institution that she already did her banking at and it wouldn't be impacting in her family relationship it was the solution for her and it's the solution for a lot of people but again didn't know that it was available to her. A lot of people don't realize that you cannot, at least in Canada, hire somebody to be your decision maker for personal care. So they they conflate, I think, the idea that you can't do it for your personal care issues, but you can do it in this case by having a trust company be your substitute decision maker for finance. And, and that's going you know, to be really important as, as our population ages. 
I, I I totally agree. And and one of the things that I'm I'm hoping that we're able to accomplish with some of our education and, and awareness um, endeavors that we're putting out there is is making people think about you know being an executor, being an attorney, being a trustee, the same way you think about any other you know service in your life. To, you know, you, you, I, I like to draw the analogy to doing your taxes. Sure, you can do it yourself if you want, but why would you want to? Um, we had a, a lawyer say to us at a cocktail party, you don't drill your own teeth. You don't even color your own hair. Why would you be your own executor or your own attorney? So it's it's a little bit of mindset shift and um, we, we won't get everybody there. But I think as people start to think about it, it's just one more professional service that really needs to be deeply considered to think it, it's, it's not about, you know, your own self at that point. It's about those that you're leaving behind. Tell me a little bit as you wrap up about how the trust company as a, let's in this case, let's talk about them as an attorney, as a substitute decision maker, when a person is alive, but incapable, how do they know the person? So what I hear sometimes is, well, I, I would have it, but they don't really know me. I mean, we have a good relationship, but you know, they, do they know me enough? Maybe I should have my kids or, or somebody else who knows me well. But I know for a fact that you must do quite a lot of connecting around knowing the values, the wishes, the beliefs, and the goals of that person. Can you just speak a little bit about that to assure people that there is kind of some type of work in place so that they would know the wishes of the client? Yeah, there's a lot of upfront work that we would put into, assuming this is part of the individual's planning, right? Where they're, as opposed to us stepping in in a moment of crisis. Um, there, there's a lot of work that's done to, to understand that client and their situation, as you said, their goals, their wishes, what, what would they want to have happen in that instance. And we're often working closely with an existing RBC partner. So someone who knows them well through um, other financial relationships, a relationship manager, if you will. And so in, in conjunction, you know, we're really able to, um, to be able to get a good understanding. And of course, those things change over time. And so we need to stay current with that. We talked about the know your client um, a bit earlier and, and staying current with changes in, in a client's life is, is a part of that as well. And then once we're called upon to act, you know, we would we would be in contact with the individual that is named as power of attorney for personal care as well, so that there's a deep connectivity there to make sure that although they can't maybe speak for themselves any longer, or they may be in a care facility of some type or whatever the case may be, we we have a good understanding of what's going on in in their lives and uh, and how we can support that from a financial perspective. The last question I'm going to ask is thinking forward. And so we ask each of our change makers and our thought leaders about more people entering this field, because we know that as a demographic shifts, we need more people who are professionally interested in serving in this area. So thinking kind of backwards to supporting your students, thinking outwards to supporting the community. Do you have any words of encouragement or advice to younger people who might be considering entering a field like in a trust company or a field looking at the issues of aging? I think it's, uh, there's a whole economy being built here on, uh, on aging and longevity. And so uh, there is no question that it's a great place for someone who's starting their career to look at right now. In fact, anyone who's got kids that are just sort of coming out of university and wondering what to do, I'm, I'm always suggesting that they look at anything that has to do with um, servicing older Canadians, because that's going to be very uh, a very busy area. And, and we're so lucky uh, at the trust company right now that um, there is a great deal of interest and, and you know, there's people that are coming to us uh, for a career, as a career destination um, that, you know, we're, we've had a lot of bright young folks join us in the last several years. And it's so fun to see um, this influx of new talent and the next generation wanting to, to get into this field. There's, there's an interesting mix of, um, you know, empathy, and technical abilities that that we look for when we're looking to hire people into the trust company for for obvious reasons, given the na given the nature of the work that we do, and uh, so it's really interesting to see this next generation come up and and not only 
um, show such an interest, but also the way that they're interested in changing it and modernizing it, right? So we're, um, we're, uh, you know, that's that's one of the things that uh, that I'm really loving right now is this transition of of staff and personnel and uh, and the mindset of um, what what the future of this trust company is going to look like. What it's going to look like is a place I think of both empathy and good planning, which is all that you could ever ask from any organization and especially from a trust company. And it is of course, very shaped by our leadership. And that's why we're so grateful for you spending some time today in our CanAge conversations, highlighting Canadian leadership in the area of aging. I've been speaking with Leanne Kaufman of RBC Trust, and this has been a wonderful opportunity to explore the personal and the professional and the future in our field of aging together. Do make sure to follow Leanne on her social media channels, which are posted below. And we look forward to continuing our conversation with RBC in their thought leadership in this field. Thanks very much, Leanne. Thank you.